Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. This season of Negative Camber the Motorsport Show is proudly brought to you by True Steel Frames, Move Yourself Trailer Hire, Red Mill Bakery, Pro Karts Race Centre Paraka, Barberino, TD Racing, T4, Patrizzi Course, IKD, DR Karts Australia and Radio Italia 1. Radio Italia 1 It's lights out and away we go. Russell does get away well, as does Max Verstappen. And Valtteri Bottas has got his teammate right alongside him already. Welcome to Negative Camber. No! If it's motorsport you want, then this is the place to be. All of the latest results, analysis and interviews. And a great start for car number 11. Delberto's got away beautifully at the start of the great race. Proudly sponsored by True Steel Frames a leading supply, service and manufacturer of steel frames and roof trusses. Down the inside, Hamilton sees it coming. It's a late lunch by Verstappen who takes the lead of the race. Right now on Radio Italia Uno 87.6. And now it's time to introduce your hosts, Jamie Lemure and Lee Harrison. Hello everyone and welcome back to Negative Camber, the motorsport show, proudly brought to you by True Steel Frames and supporters of the Scuderia Ferrari Club Adelaide. I'm your host, Jamie Lemura. Happy Easter to the Catholic Easter and the general population last week and to all our Orthodox friends this weekend. Alongside me in this beautiful caper known as Negative Camber is none other than my co-host, my partner in crime, my co-driver, and the man that's about to do an epic stint across the country to WA, none other than Mr. Lee Harrison. It's now become tradition for you to leave that gap in between the uh, your intro and everything else just to build the suspense. Suspenseful times. It just draws the listeners in. Oh, it draws me and I'm like, oh, he's done it again. <laughs> My God. How are you going, man? What's happening? Ah, uh, look, I am doing well, considering all things uh, as they are, but uh, yeah, feeling it a little bit tonight, and uh, yeah, like you said, on the way to WA in the morning, so uh, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a, a big track, and uh, really looking forward to it. Have you got the trailer prepared? Is it all welded? Is it? Are we going to have a nice, smooth, three-day drive? No, nah, there's no trailer coming, so it should be sweet. We're just taking the van. Um, nice. It's going to be loaded to the top. Um, it's going to be bursting at the seams, but uh, yeah, no, it should be should be nice, easy, smooth sailing. Drive across to to WA for for the nationals. Is it diesel or or fuel? Uh, it's diesel. Okay, yeah. so that's not too bad. Yeah, looking after the environment. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> looking after your wallet, well, Cody's wallet as yeah, well, exactly. I guess. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And how's Cody getting there this time? Yeah, uh, he's the rock star driver. Fly in, fly out. So uh, I'll pick him up from the airport on uh, Wednesday and, and Thursday morning. He'll rock up to the track for practice and the tent, the go kart. Everything will be there, ready to go. So. Yeah, lifestyle of uh, of the fly in fly out driver. I tell you what, if he doesn't know qualifying after his relaxed build up, <laughs> not yeah. take over the driver's seat, mate. Yeah, look, we <laughs> just uh, we've got two days of testing this time, so that'll that'll help us out a little bit. But uh, yeah, it's been a busy weekend as well. We've been at uh, the football today, uh, watching the Hawks play GWS. It was my father in law's birthday yesterday, so shout out to my father in law for. Turning 63, I think, as well as my mum turned 63 as well today. So, uh, yeah, it's been a busy weekend with mum coming over yesterday and, yeah, seeing seeing the father-in-law yesterday and today. And, yeah, it's a bit, and we went out for dinner. It was Biscuits' mum's birthday on Easter weekend. So went out for dinner at the zoo last night. So that got uh, got a little bit spirited, which was, which was always fun. You're hanging out with your rock apes and, and gorilla friends over there, were you? No, the pandas. Oh, the pandas? Yeah, we we're in the panda uh, exhibit there. So. Have Wang Wang and Funi actually like consummated the relationship and actually started to breed? I don't know. I don't <laughs> think so. Like It's been going on for so long now. Oh, They've got to give up, I reckon. Frigates, the both of them. Yeah. Um, how was your Easter? Yeah, good. So um, it's been 
Uh, the girls went away with their dad for Easter, which was um, allowed Shay and I to have some time to celebrate our anniversary. So I took her to Stansbury and we stayed in a little um, a little pod um, with you know in the back corner of a farm with ocean views and stuff. So yeah, that was quite nice. Waking up there in Stansbury every morning and nice and quiet and no screaming children and no noise and no cars and anything like that so yeah it was nice and quiet bit of sea air filling the lungs exactly right very and, nice yeah we ate at the pub every single night and yeah <laughs> it was good fun <laughs> we went and bought about 300 dollars worth of like goodies and gourmet cheeses and stuff to take with us and didn't eat any of it because we were just at the pub was your wife complaining today about the supposed lack of drinks that was available for her at the bar yeah yeah they were not a very good actually like yeah Look, not a very good selection today, um, and yeah, completely crowded. Um, the toilets was it were over. Yeah, it was at Norwood Oval. Toilets okay. were overrun, um, bars were overrun, like lining up for an hour to get get a beer and stuff. And really, there was nothing for for the wine drinkers. So there was no wine, no Sav Blanc or anything like that. And uh, yeah, it was quite hard to find uh, anything other than a than a Carlton Draft or something like that. So water can't go wrong. Yeah, well, look, I gave up after a little while and just thought, ah, we'll, we'll go with nothing. Yeah, fair enough. What was the, um, who ended up winning that game? G- it was a thriller. Like, GWS ended up winning by two points and they were behind for, like, most of the game. So, um, yeah, I think we left with, well, I left with about 15 minutes to go and the rest of the fam stayed there and, and saw it out so that I could beat the rush and make it here tonight. Nice, nice. Well, it's good to have you here. Hopefully, you actually arrive in Perth in one piece and that you're back here in a couple of weeks' time. I'm sure I'll make it. No problems at all, yeah. <laughs> ah, good, good. Um, big news for us. We, uh, we've we gone on to the Ozcast Network, which was uh, which is amazing. So, uh, big props to uh, to MA, Mr. Mark Aston, for opening that door and making us aware of, of the network, but then also Andy, who uh, wanted to actually add us to to his station, if you want to call it that. So uh, that allows us to put the show to another level. Uh, it allows us to have the show pretty much across every major podcast platform that that um, they could possibly imagine. Andy's got significant experience with uh, Nova and Fresh FM at, at a variety of levels as well. So that'll allow us to eventually, um, you know, improve production and do some little nifty bits and pieces. So we we'll get to utilise the studios a little bit as well. When um, we've got uh, a very special guest in May that uh, I'm very looking forward, very much looking forward to interviewing, but I'll have to keep that under wraps for now. Um, but no, that'll that'll bring the show to to another level again. So, I mean, it, it's fascinating to see the reach that even just Spotify actually gives us. And who, I mean, we've got people in India now that know our show, so um, which is amazing. But um, yeah. None of it's actually, re- re- you know, resulted in us having like you know red carpet or, you know, black tie invites and all that sort of stuff. I'll, I'll work towards that. I'll bring some red carpet for you next time if that's if that's what you're working towards. Just to help you realise your goals. Ah, uh, that's all right. You need you actually know what you need to bring. You need to bring Garnet Patterson here. That's uh, what you need. To bring. Yeah, well, he owes he, us badly. Well, he was going to come tonight, but um, I think he's in Sydney. So uh, we've we've we're working on it. It's just schedules with busy people don't align as as good and uh, it would be great to have him here in the studio rather than on the phone so that it uh, it sounds nice and crisp yeah well he's picked up a few drives so it'd be good to um to actually chat to him and see where how he divides his time up because he's got a few gigs going at the same time yeah, which is pretty cool plenty going on this year he's a busy boy yeah absolutely speaking of busy we've got a lot on our plate tonight uh first thing i wanted to cover though before we get into other formalities is um scuderi Ferrari club are doing a bit of a membership drive $55 memberships going for all members and membership packs will be on their way shortly. So um, not only do you support the club, the largest Australian club, the only one that's actually going at the moment, which is sad for Sydney and Melbourne, but great for us. Um, but also um, we're a motorsport club, effectively, so you don't have to be a, a massive Ferrari to Forzi or or, uh, or a fan to be a part of what we do. So Membership packs include lanyards, caps, leather-bound notebooks, driver's cards, info on this year's car, the hyper car as well. We'll probably touch on Portimao during your Around the World segment. Uh, but also you get discounts on Ferrari merch as well as karting and motorsport equipment through our established network too. You get to have access to you know, the man sitting across the desk from me and the Florida Tiger over there with his jumper on at the moment. It's a panther. Uh, is it a panther? It's, it's a panther. Like, it looks more like a tiger. No, it's a panther. That's a really bad... Bad panther. That's a tiger. <laughs> I'm gonna call it as a tiger. 
It's a anyway. panther. All right, it's a panther. So, um, and yeah, much, much more. So, fifty-five dollars is is all that's required. Uh, jump onto the website www.sfcadelaide.com. Can't miss it because the first thing you see on the page is join and become a member, follow the bouncing ball, and become and support uh, the largest. Well, F1 fan club uh, in Australia, which is great. I see what you did there too with making the uh, the membership price fifty five dollars, oh, Carlos. That's, that's just out of pure circumstance more than anything else. It was sure, a fluke. Sure, oh, it was. I, well, it could also be my racing number. I mean, look at fifty five. No, we know Carlos signs. But like that fifty five dollars, that's a steal. Like you get ten percent off at uh, Pro Karts per acre with that, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, like how long does it take to to make you fifty five dollars back? You get it back in a few se- few sessions, that's for sure. Minutes, if in in one session at Pro Karts, but then also with other discounts as well. So, um, speaking of the well. In terms of next coming up, we've got the round two of the South Australian High Kart Championship, which is now going to be held at Extreme Karts at Gawler. I actually made the venture out to that track uh, the other week and had my first little look at the facility, and pretty impressive. It's massive, big, big setup. So um, it's going to be a fantastic event. We're going to have three heats uh, and a qualifying session as well. Uh, entries are open now on the club website, so it's $110 to race, but you get a 40 lap, uh, two 15 lap heats, and also a five lap qualifying session plus food and drinks as well. Uh, jump onto the website, onto the online store, once again, www.sfcadelaide.com. Before we head off to our break, you are off to Perth for Australian Kart Championships round two. Round two. Yep. First time since 2011, I believe, that they're hosting the races there. Yeah, yeah. so, so the last time they had it was a uh, it was when uh, the one, one-off one nationals was still a thing over yep. the Easter long weekend. Yep. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's been a little while. I've never been there um, to race. Um, neither's Cody. Um, so it's going to be a really big learning experience. But we've got four sessions of practice on Thursday and then four sessions of practice on Friday. So I think um, we downloaded the, uh, the track on the sim at work. So... Um, yeah, we've got a couple of laps in, sort of figured out what we might like to start with a base setup, and uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, fair enough. Did they crack 400 for this event? No, nah, not quite. I think it was like 387 or something. <sighs> wow, that's ridiculous. Yeah. That's yeah. still bigger than what was that round one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, massive, massive. Yeah, yeah amazing, amazing. But uh, yes, it's probably a big reason why they cancelled the Barossa race this weekend too. They were wondering why they were short of entries, but when you've got a week's drive effectively to across the Nullarbor. Yeah, that, like, look, there's a lot happening. There's the mm. Gather Round, there's Live Golf next weekend, there's the Nationals, and, and unfortunately, um, yeah, karting's still. just not a sport, a sport that's cheap, mm. um, and it's not one of those things where you, yeah, you can afford to do even all the little small things anymore. So, mm. you know... Back in the day, in the early thousands, entries were like fifty dollars a class, and or forty five dollars for your second class. Now it's like double that, double that for tires and all the rest of the jazz. And it's just yeah, for for what is essentially a nothing meeting, or was not really a, you know a, a title, a festival Quite state big. cup, or anything like that. Yeah, it's just not uh, it's not that high up there. Yep, fair enough. Sad, but. It is what it is. I think, um, you know, it's easy for me to say from uh, as a competitor, but on the other side of the fence. But I, I do think that they need to really have a, a sit down as a as a organisation, being Cutting SA, and really think about how they're going to map out that calendar for next year. Because there's been too many clashes with too many big events for the first portion of this year, um, to you know, which results in this sort of stuff as well, yeah. which is unfortunate. However. I do know that it is a tough job and someone's got to do it, so I don't envy that position. What I don't envy is the next segment, which is Formula One, because it's going to be a very emotive piece. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt about this. We'll be off to a break, and then when we come back, we will dissect the Melbourne Formula One Grand Prix. Listening to Negative Camber, sponsored by True Steel Frames, providing steel frames and roof trusses for any size projects. TrueSteelFrames.com.au. Welcome back to Negative Camber, the motorsports show, proudly supporting the Scuderia Ferrari Club Adelaide and proudly brought to you by True Steel Frames. Well, Formula One. Yes, we're, we're mixing it up tonight. There's no karting really to sort of talk about, but we thought. 
Let's nip this in the bud because it's going to be quite a lengthy topic and it is the review of the Rolex Australian Formula 1 Grand Prix held at Albert Park in Melbourne before we do some race highlights. Uh, takeaways from, I guess, people that went there. I, was, I spoke to a few people that had made the trip. My brother in particular was one. Massive event, like mm-hmm. heaps of people. Yeah, heaps of people. Yeah, it was sold out on all four days and... Uh, yeah, I think they said it was 450,000 people or something mm. like that went. And, uh, yeah, no, they did a good job. And, uh, look, every race this year has been sold out pretty well. So, you know, it goes back to that. We've said it a few times. goes back to Netflix, goes back to Drive to Survive. They go, they're go, they getting the audience built up. And, you know, there's there's a, almost a spectacle to the racing. The racing has been quite good. Um, uh, you know, if you, don't, if you take away the... The one car that's winning every race um, quite comfortably, then the, the next sort of four or five cars are pretty close, and it's been creating some good racing. Yeah, absolutely. Look, they weren't. Afraid. There was people that they were speaking to over the whole broadcast on Sky Sports, your favourite channel, mm-hmm. and um, <laughs> I saw them. Um, your favourite channel, and um, the amount of people that talked about they got into Formula One through Drive to Survive. My sister-in-law is. She's openly. She's actually now watching all of the seasons of Drive to Survive. Yep. So um, you know it. It has its detractors. It's certainly Hollywoodized the sport. You could say it has an influence on some of the decisions of the races. If you want to be a real skeptic, um, but there's no question about it. it. I I can't recall in my lifetime seeing the sport bigger from a from a spectator or a or a footprint standpoint than what it is at the moment. Yeah, I mean, of course, like, the last Grand Prix in Adelaide still takes the cake for the most amount of people um, for one event. But, um, yeah, it did did decline a a little ways there um, a little while back, and and it's been slowly building. But now to see pretty well every Grand Prix being sold out, um, you know, weeks in advance of the the event itself, it's it's good for the sport. It means that they're doing something right, and, yeah, hopefully some uh, some other sports can learn from it. This, This may sound like a silly question. And, I mean, you were in the thick of it with Miami, so you'd probably be the best person to ask. But it, what what defines the sellout outside of uh, sort of seating, like ticketed seating, if you want to call it that? Yeah. Because general admission, you can stand on a man. Like, do they have a, a certain capacity that they have to yeah, hit? Yeah, so it's – no, not not hit, but there's obviously a per person uh, – a, a, an amount of people per open space, um, and then that takes into account the grandstands and then any – general admission standing areas for 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 viewing so it's all dependent on local laws and local um local government uh how how it works um but uh, but yeah that's that's what they determine so we we get given you know we can put a hundred thousand people over there we can put five thousand people over there whatever it may be yep. and then that's our our max number of tickets that we can sell yeah i only ask because I, I just find it fascinating how with melbourne being given its population advantage over over adelaide and its size still hasn't been able to eclipse that record that we'd had set here yeah well, i think if you look at how times have changed the laws and and stuff like that laws yeah, and legislation true. have gotten a lot tighter and you don't see things like you did of you know, 500,000 people standing in a paddock, um, you know, anymore. So uh, it's the same thing with, like, music festivals and that sort of stuff. They've all got, um, you know, um, limits that they can work to for people. Um, so, yeah, as the as the rules get stronger uh, when idiots do what idiots do and, and cause cause carnage, then, then insurance gets involved and legislation gets involved and they go, well, that was obviously too many people and you couldn't handle it, so we'll, we'll cut the number of people. Speaking of idiots, we'll touch on uh, the fallout of the spectators at, at the race. Uh, we've got eight minutes worth of highlights to cover, so uh, we'll probably get started on that, and then uh, we will dissect. And uh, I need the eight minutes to keep myself calm mm-hmm. because I'm going to get uh, very emotive or very angry one, of, one to one or <laughs> the other. So, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go through the uh, and review the Grand Prix, and then uh, we'll be back shortly. And the Australian Grand Prix is go. Good reaction time for George Russell. Putting the pressure on Max Verstappen. Will he dive to the inside? Can Verstappen hang on to it? Russell to the inside. Russell to the lead of the Grand Prix to bring a roar from the crowd. Down to second place goes Max Verstappen. He's under pressure. Alonso is all over the back of Hamilton as well. Russell, then Verstappen, and Hamilton to the inside of Verstappen. Then nearly banging wheels. In the background goes Charles Leclerc into the gravel trap and off the road. It's Russell. Then it's Hamilton in a 
Mercedes 1-2, the pole sitter is shuffled down to third, David. Yeah, it'll be a safety car, it'll be a safety car because Charles Leclerc is beached. George Russell hooked it up nicely on that initial drive, that's exactly what we saw the, uh, the Aston Martin of uh, Fernando Alonso do in Saudi and then as Julian said there Max just got a little bit greedy trying to battle and hold on on the brakes into turn one and that gave Russell look he's bolted out front and then Max brakes a little bit conservative that opens up the door for Hamilton little bit of contact Albon off the road gravel all over the circuit he's missing a front wing and his perfect weekend has come undone with the safety car deployed Max you're all okay yeah I'm fine yeah, it's such a shame. Such a shame. Ru Russell has pitted, a... David. Russell has pitted from the lead. So Mercedes seed track position for George Russell, who puts on the hard tyre. Sykes as well. There's Alvin just oversteering his way to the barriers at the quick turn six now. Scatters gravel all over the circuit, and he's perched there right on the racing line. A little bit scary for him. Driver error from a driver that's been superb so far this weekend. A red flag and that completely changes it across the board and George Russell has given up track position when everyone now can make a tyre change under the red. Look at this though, if you're further back, you're almost stopping. They were, look Whoa. at the, the Joguar new there having no choice but to overtake a sea of cars. Yeah. And look oh at that, look at yeah. that, you've got Magnussen it's... through the gravel. Yeah, that's just dangerous, isn't it? You're not expecting it. And we're racing once again at Albert Park. Good reaction time for Lewis Hamilton. Good reaction time for Fernando Alonso, who's trying to go around the outside of oh, Verstappen. Can't do it. Top three as they were as they left the grid. Moving up into fourth place is Pierre Gasly. Dropping down is George Russell, but he's made a couple of positions off the line. And it's very, very tight to turn three. But Hamilton maintains the lead. Then it's Verstappen. Then it's Alonso. Then we've got Gasly, Russell, Stroll, Hulkenberg, Sonoda, Norris. And Contact. Luz. Oh, off the road in the background goes Nick to freeze. This is going to be the chance then. Verstappen will get DRS. Oh, this is such a high speed part of the racetrack. These two world champions, these two rivals, about to go wheel to wheel once again, surely. Around the outside goes Max Verstappen. Can Hamilton fight back? There's nothing Hamilton can do. And Max Verstappen roars past. Hamilton has to defend to the left. And look at that with the DRS. Three cars not separated by much as we head to turn 11. Russell forced to the outside line, trying to go past the Alpine. Will he be given room? He will. And George Russell completes a tidy pass. Russell dropping down the order. Got to be a problem for George Russell. There is a problem he's pulling off in the background of your shots. And the British driver has a failure. The one-time race leader is out. Yeah, that is a major failure. And he's going to pull off at the end of the pit lane. He's done it again, Sergio Perez at turn nine. Normally, as Julian knows, you wouldn't really want to risk it. There, you would maybe want to wait until the next part, and wow, that is brave. Perez on Piastri here, oh, oh, same corner. No, not around the outside. Around the outside, Sergio Perez. That Red Bull is a rocket ship. Whoa, finally, Carlos Sainz to the inside and taking fourth place with a late lunge and a move at turn three, which has been a long time coming. Just did the uh, the sort of the double shuffle, looked like he was going to the left and then pulled it back to the inside. Gasly probably, because, uh, you know, when you're in the cockpit, you glance in your mirrors and then, of course, you have to look at where you're going and almost clip the back of them. It's an absolute beauty of a move, that. <laughs> Big moment, that's got to be Max Verstappen off the road. There was a noise from the crowd, we cut to it mid-shot. Max Verstappen weaving. He's had a spin, he's had a spin, I'm sure, down at 13. He was pushing four. Let's have another look, we're in the, this is turn 12, we're heading to 13, and this was very nearly the race getting away from Max yeah. Verstappen. Second last corner, locks it up, and Ooh. onto the grass. I keep front locking there, really. Okay, understood. Yeah, he got away with it but that was a heart in the mouth moment can he make the way by on the outside once again Hulkenberg placing the car really nicely using the kerb but there's a chance now for Lando Norris to go to the inside side by side they go and it's on the road for Hulkenberg it's eighth place for Lando Norris and it's very very tricky to keep your foot in on the outside of turn 12 here we go this time he just gets on the gas a little bit earlier, squeezes the throttle, gets that overlap, which is crucial. And from that, down the inside of 12, 
And that's uh, tyre carcass off the back of the house. That's Kevin Magnussen with an ailing car and a yellow flag in sector one. Suspension's okay. And it, oh, he hit, oh. did he hit the wall? Yeah, and that's what caused it. Well, that leaves the jitters for everyone else. Just don't hit the wall and, and you'll be all right. Red flag for the second time in this Grand Prix. Can you believe this? It's two laps to sort out who wins this one. Immediately, Verstappen is chopping ahead of Lewis Hamilton, who will try and edge out Fernando Alonso. It's as you were from the top three. It's going to be close to contact, and Fernando Alonso is spun round by Carlos Sainz. Perez is off the road. It's Max Verstappen with the lead. Then it's Hamilton, and there's a crash in the back of the field. Into the wall goes Gasly, and it's absolute chaos on the restart. Oh, he's deep. He's deep stroll into the corner. It's total, total chaos. It's Verstappen, Hamilton, and then it's Sainz. Up to fourth goes Hulkenberg. Red flag again. Carnage. Absolute chaos. Alonso gets a good start, is running with Hamilton, look behind, it's actually Sainz and, uh, and Gasly that are side by side, Sainz goes in hard with Gasly, and uh, Gasly goes in deep enough himself, Sainz tips Alonso into the spin, then you've got your two Alpines that must come to blows themselves then afterwards. So we're going into turn one, there's the lock up ahead, there's no idea where to place it, Gasly rejoining, and then these two, Gasly doesn't know his oh. teammates there, and detonation for the Alpines. Sainz is looking and he's fighting with Gasly. They both draw each other in to go in too deep. And Alonso is looking at switchback time on Hamilton. Hits the right rear of Alonso. Rolling start procedure across the line. For the first time in his Formula One career, Max Verstappen wins the Australian Grand Prix. And well done. Yeah, well, it took a while, but uh, when it's a win, we take it. Good, uh, good weekend. Here's the result of the Australian Grand Prix. Verstappen taking his second win of the season and his first in Australia. Lewis Hamilton's first podium of the season. Mercedes' first podium of the season. In second place, Fernando Alonso. All three Grand Prix this year. In third, but what drama on that late restart. It nearly cost him. Max Verstappen extends his lead in the World Championship. It's out to 69 points. Then Sergio Perez. It's Fernando Alonso with 45. Lewis Hamilton closing in on him, though, in fourth place. Sainz finds himself in fifth, Stroll P6, and it's Russell, Norris, Hulkenberg, Charles Leclerc. And there you have it. That is the roundup of what was an entertaining and somewhat controversial uh, Australian Grand Prix. Uh, I'll very quickly run through the top 10 of the race, and then we'll head off to a break, and we come back and we'll talk more about it. Max Verstappen first, Lewis Hamilton second, Fernando Alonso third, Lance Stroll fourth, Sergio Perez fifth, Lando Norris sixth, Nico Hulkenberg seventh, Oscar Piastri well done first points in your homeland in eighth, Zhao Ganyu in ninth, and Yuki Tsunoda in tenth. Very confident that Carlos Sainz will get his fourth place back. We'll cover all of that and more after the break. Listening to Negative Camber, sponsored by True Steel Frames, providing steel frames and roof trusses for any size projects. TrueSteelFrames.com.au. Welcome back to Negative Camber, the motorsport show, proudly brought to you by True Steel Frames and proudly supported by the Scuderia Ferrari Club of Adelaide. Uh, I'm fired up, Lee. I'll tell you why. Because I'm tired, tired of the farcical international association of automobiles known as the FIA and their handling of race results and their inconsistencies of overall results because, man, I, uh, okay, I need to think of this logically because my heart will take over my head, all right? However... When you're wearing that much red with some of the decisions you're going to be talking about, I don't feel like you can talk logically. I'll be able to talk logically. <laughs> All right, so it goes like this. So obviously, you've heard on the in the previous uh, prior to the ad, uh, Sainz and Alonso have a coming together, and there's cars skittled all over the place, and and that type of thing, and there's chaos and bedlam and and the like as well. Cars roll back into the pit lane. It was what twenty five thirty minutes, and then sanctions were being uh, given left, right, and centre. Carlos Sainz gets a five second penalty. But Fernando Alonso gets his third position back. And the Alpines, which were within the top 10, are DNF'd. 
Um, Logan Sargent, Nick DeVries, they've gone by the wayside. Lance Stroll, who then went off the road along with Sergio Perez, they got their positions back because, and here is for you, Mr. FIA, 57.3 of the sporting regulations states that in the event of a red flag, the order will be taken at the last point at which it was possible to determine the positions of all cars. However, under 57.3.8, race control determined that the last point at which it was possible to determine the position of all cars was when the last grid was formed. Now, the reason why these points have come up is because Haas, after the race and after all cars crossed the line, raised a protest in regards to the overall result because if the correct positions... Sorry, if the positions had actually been put in place after the cars had crossed that line, Nico Hülkenberg would have finished fourth. It would have been fourth. So when they were summoned to the race director after the race to get further clarification as to why they weren't going to, the race director then turned around and said that in the time available for the continuation of the race, the most reliable point was the last grid, given the data available to him at the time, the relative positions of the cars and the incidents on the track. Relative positions of the cars and the incidents on track. So therefore, how can you give someone third place back and they deemed the finishing results based on lap 57 prior to the accident and yet you still give someone a five-second penalty irrespective of the fact that it's my, my guy. It could have been Daniel Ricciardo for all we know had he been racing. How can you give someone a five-second penalty for a lap that didn't exist? You then don't give points to two cars that were then written off, right? Then you then don't give penalties to... Uh, and you give Sergio Perez his position. You give Lance Stroll his position. You don't penalise Logan Sargent. And you don't penalise Nick, De- uh, Nick DeVries for their coming together. But yet, somehow, the penalty still stands. It does not make sense. Now, if the lap did exist and they did... Uh, form up after the event, after that lap, right? Absolutely, penalty any day of the week. There's no no dispute after that, but it didn't. And that's the point that Ferrari are going to go with to the stewards to say, well, you've given a guy who wasn't third his third place back. You've given another guy that finished fourth, he was off the road, and yet you've given us not only a five-second penalty, but it then ended up being out of the points, Right. That's where the inconsistency lies. That's why it's the farcical International Automobile Association, known as the FIA, and he will get his fourth place back because it, it's just logical. He, it's logical, Lee. He will not get his fourth place back, but I do do agree with you. If they had, uh, if if like you said, the 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 ruling states that it's on the last point where a order can be determined. Well, then they if they're going to take the Fin- the starting order from the end of lap 56, then they need to restart the race from lap- the end of lap 56. So wh- what I think should have been happening was they should have been lining up on the grid again for a two-lap sprint, the same as they were doing so when Science cannonballed into the side of Alonso and got his five-second deserved penalty. It was just a kiss. Um, <laughs> and starting a two-lap battle again, minus the with with holes left in the grid for the cars, they like the Alpines, they would not have been there. So they're hot. There would have been holes on the grid for them to um, to not not be in. Um, but yeah, then they would have been doing a two-lap race. It's like they've taken a result and then given the points to the to the people at the end of the race, but missed two laps of racing. So yeah, um, yeah, like it is on my uh, on my list here. Like you know. They say that they can't extend the race by by number of laps um, because they you know cars don't fuel up with enough fuel or whatever to expect extra laps. But then if you can't do that, then you can't just take a result from a, two laps before when they came into the pit and crossed the control line. We could see how they were lined up when they came into the pits. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I agree. I feel like Hulkenberg was robbed massively. Um he he would have been fourth, and then when Science got his five second penalty, which was deserved, he would have been third. So they Haas were robbed of a podium. Um, so yeah, look, there's been three instances that you can think of in the last year and a half that uh, the race has finished on this edge, and uh, it's it's happened three different ways. So there yeah. just there just needs to be some sort of consistency happening. Monza they finished under the safety car. 
uh, Abu Dhabi. They got the race going again, which is what everyone wants to see. They want to see the race finish under under you know the green flag, um, and then yeah, they've gone to Australia and then finished it under some sort of farcical safety car. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just think that um, to me, it, it almost it almost reeked of the fact, and I'll probably be somewhat controversial when I say this, but I'm convinced that the FIA decided to keep Alonso in third because it's illogical out of that. They've kept him in third in the hope that he still remains within the title fight later in the year because if you drop him from third, it's going to be Verstappen, Golf, Perez second, Golf, Alonso third in the point standings and you could just about say yep, title's done after race three. You know, So at least they're, they've, they've given it to him. Um, and, yeah, and they, they used that precedent of the British Grand Prix for Zhao Ganyu's incident last year, yeah. which, you know, okay, fair enough. You've set a precedent, et cetera, et cetera. I get all that. <sighs> the stigma and the ghost of Michael Massey, who coincidentally was actually at the Grand Prix that weekend. I don't think it's got anything to do with, with what he's done. Like, he got the race going under green flags and we finished a race and we had a good a good way to end the championship. But It's um, more the after effect of that, though, that whole thing that happened after the fact. Yeah, well, there's just... The, with for such, for a rule book that's so so thick and so many rules, there's so many grey areas and so many things that aren't clearly defined. So, I think that's what just needs to happen is that there's too much uh, room in there for interpretation, um, and that's that's not the best way to go motor racing. Um, you know, even like you see um, when George Russell stopped, well, they did a full restart for Guo Gro- Gro- Guan Yu's crash, um, but because George Russell got out of his car, they counted him as DNFing. He got out of the car to check on the safety of a, another driver. That should be rewarded, not you know, yeah. not um, not hated upon. So um, yeah, yep. that's just just little things like that are a little bit annoying. And yeah, look, I got straight on the blower to a couple of people that I know that are race directors at high levels and and that sort of stuff, and and they were feverishly flicking through. Uh, rule books and stuff as well, and, and giving me their opinion on what would have happened in their series, and and yeah, well, there was there was still some some uh, a differing of opinions between them as well. Please, 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 FIA, please mm. give him back his fourth place. Oh, that broke my heart. Man. It's not going to happen. It's going to happen. You what? I've got to put a wager. I bet you it's going to happen. So bet anyway, it doesn't. <sighs> anyway, so uh, there's more points outside of that accident, out of that whole Grand Prix. There was heaps to cover. So. Charles Leclerc, probably the worst possible start of the season you could ever possibly imagine. Two DNFs and a distant, what, seventh or eighth, I think it was, in the last race. So he's six points, a mile and a half off, uh, anywhere near looking like championship contention at the moment, has to get the title back on track in Azerbaijan. Uh, but if you if you look at it on the flip side, he had the same start to the championship last year as Max Verstappen has had this year and went on to lose it, and, and Max Verstappen won it. So, yeah. <laughs> He yeah. can still take some sort of solace in the fact that it's only round three. There's still 19 rounds to go. It's not over. No, look, by not by any stretch. I, if if a car was performing like the Red Bull was, like the Red Bull is this year, then I would say, nah, it's all right. No, no drama at all. But they're not on the same pace. There's no. I mean, and now we're going to Azerbaijan with Red Bull straight line speed and DRS zone. <laughs> you give them a front row start. And probably, I would say, at least a second a lap advantage. I wouldn't say it's going to be that much. Mercedes, um, obviously, with a, a track like Melbourne that was a bit more slippery um, and not so much about stop-start, they showed that their car has come up a little bit as well. Um, so I don't think we can discount Mercedes. They've got a fast engine. We know that they've had the best engine of the turbo hybrid era. Um, so, I, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't discount them and I wouldn't put... Um, uh, Red Bull that far up the road and again Aston Martin they've got a good car as well so um, I don't think it's going to be you know as as smooth sailing for, for Red Bull as we think and you know as of a Jan's where we normally start to see all the updates and stuff start coming so hopefully hopefully some other teams have got some, some bits and pieces they're going to bolt on Look, Smokey would be uh, Aston Martin for sure. Uh, the last couple of years that they've had that race there at Azerbaijan, they've actually done really well, uh, you know, especially under Vettel. Fernando will uh, will be one to watch, no doubt. Uh, we'll be off to a break, and then we come back. Further talking points from the Melbourne Grand Prix. You're listening to Negative Camber, sponsored by True Steel Frames, providing steel frames and roof trusses for any size projects. TrueSteelFrames.com.au 
Welcome back to Negative Camber, the motorsport show, proudly brought to you by True Steel Frames and proud supporters of the Scuderia Ferrari Club, Adelaide. Mind the uh, the noise going in the background there. Mr. Mm. Mark Haston decided to uh, walk in and bombard us in the studio with uh, with some points that he wanted to add and then realised the red lights went on in the mic and, yes, we've uh, just stopped ourselves from laughing at that. That, that ad break was not as long as anyone was expecting it no. to be and clearly Mark Haston was yeah. not expecting <laughs> it to be that short. <laughs> oh, hello, Mark. How are you? I'm so sorry about that. I mean, here no, I am not. teaching you guys how to do the job and I come in unprofessionally and completely stuff them. <laughs> <laughs> Back in your cave. <laughs> right. Who gave uh, him the keys? Oh, anyone would think he's the general manager of the station. So, um, Mr. Verstappen was very happy with his first Australian Grand Prix win, uh, but uh, decided that he wanted to make a point about the pass from Lewis, which was superbly executed, I must say. I don't think Max had any right to complain about the quality of that pass. No, I don't think so. It was, you know, fair, fair game for me. He gave him just enough to keep him on the AstroTurf on the outside of the corner. And, yeah, I think uh, Max was on the on the receiving end this time of having to play championship or, or risk getting taken out, like he put Lewis in the position of so many times in 2021. So, yeah, absolute, um, you know, Lewis doesn't forget and has, has given it back to him. Isn't it funny how all drivers, uh, as soon as they get, if they have a pass pulled like uh, pulled on them like that, before you could even blink, they're on on the blower to the engineer saying, he's pushed me wide, he's done this and stuff. Like, yeah. Come on, guys. They're all a bit soft. Um, just a bit. Yeah, a bit precious. And uh, they just got to remember what they're getting paid millions and millions of dollars to do. So, um, you know, if it was a fair push wide and you've gone out to the gravel and whatever, then, yeah, fair enough. Get on the radio and have a, have a cry about it. But when all you've done is lost or conceded one spot, then, then get on with it. Get racing. Man, have you have you ever seen the famous footage of um, the French Grand Prix of 1979 with Gilles Villeneuve and Renéanu? You're going to have to go further than that. I, I, you know, see that many clips that just a short short okay. one doesn't. Do yourself a favour when we have a break, and it only goes for a couple of minutes. But they touch wheels and hit each other probably about seven or eight yep. times, and it wasn't out of malice because they were the best of friends. But it was too. Hard nuts Man, just going out on the line. Wheel to wheel. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And no complaints. Right. It's now it's actually now considered the, the greatest on track battle in Formula One yeah. history. Yeah. So you know what? And those cars were far less safer than what they are now. There was no hands device, there was none of this sort of stuff. I think some of these drivers just got to grow a pair of kahunas and actually just you know. Yeah, I mean the only difference back then was it was a lot easier to see where you were in comparison to the other car. So, you know, they could do that without risk of it being such a big ex- accident, but now it's um it's very easy to to just be unpositioned on track and and yeah not know where you are and it causes a, a pretty pretty high incident. So yeah yeah, but anyway, I, I agree. Like Lewis had fair right to the corner, and you know if anything, um, yeah, George's was putting Max out of position more than Lewis did. Mm, mm, absolutely. What was your take on on Mercedes uh, form? For Melbourne, not, yeah, it like was said, certainly they, impressive. Yeah, slippery track though. Like they're not a lot of little slow and low speed stuff. So that's where they're gonna, you know, make up. Or they're not gonna lose as much time um, mm. if they're not having to slow down so much. We said they've got the fast engine. They've got a slippery car as well. Um, not as slippery as Red Bull, but um, yeah, the, they'll go well. It seems until we say they bring some updates on some tracks that are, have no slow speed sections um you see all the stuff that's slow speed for them now at bahrain and at uh, at saudi arabia was where their weaknesses were mm, mm. how do you reckon they'd go to a track like miami because that's not too far away yeah i mean that is pretty that's a lot of medium medium to high speed stuff but they would they'll lose it over the back section under the under the underpass um and then at the far end of the track again before coming back onto the main straight so um i don't see them unless they bring some updates to azerbaijan um you know, really fighting for the win at Miami. Yeah, fair enough. And Oscar Piastri, first points, um, pretty pretty solid drive, I thought, all things considered. He was, you know, obviously the car's clearly not up to a level, but he, he held his own. He did all right. Yeah, and he showed that he can take it to Lando as well. Like, he was often, um, you know, a little bit faster than Lando in some of the practice sessions and early on in qualifying. And um, even in, in the race, he matched Lando's times and was never far away from him, probably just lacked some of that passing aggression that someone that's been in the sport for m- more years would have would have had. 
Um, but yeah, and again, he he was one that's probably been um, hard done by with the way that the race finished because I think if you took it from the way they ended lap uh, fifty seven when they came into the pits, he would have been fifth or sixth, mm. um, sitting right on on, on the back of. Uh, Norris or even in front of him I can't remember it was, but they were right behind each other um, so yeah I think he's another one that got hard done by and instead of being an 8th spot it probably easily could have been a 6th or 5th yeah absolutely it was nice to see McLaren sort of show some sort of semblance of form there would have been nothing worse for them to have another Saudi Arabia like performance yep. qualifying aside yep. and just trundling at the back yep. it would have been a bitter pill to swallow for them and again hopefully it's not just a one off thing for Melbourne um, and, and it carries through into you know they're still on the edge of the points for azerbaijan and into miami yeah what was your take on uh, on sergio perez over the weekend he had a weekend didn't he yeah he had a weekend um yeah i think even like max obviously made that mistake in the final final stages of the race as well so the car was not being super friendly to drive um and whether that's something that they did i think they brought a front wing upgrade um to the to the track so whether that had some sort of ill effect on their braking. Um, I don't know, but Perez definitely struggled with it a lot more than um, than Max did. And uh, for Perez, it couldn't have come at a worse time with Daniel sitting there at the mm. first Grand Prix that he's attended this year. Yep. Um, they did a seat fitting and all that sort of stuff. So, man, I don't know. Maybe maybe Perez got nervous um, seeing Daniel there and, and ready to go and having a seat fitting and, and all the rest of it. So, yeah, he had, he had a weekend to forget. Yeah, it's interesting because... Depending on who you believe, there was word going around from what I've read and a lot of sites that I've read that there was um, a brake balance issue with Perez's car on Saturday. Yeah. And they were trying to rectify it in practice three and they thought they got on top of it, but then it came back to bite him in qualifying because he was making the errors were really uncharacteristic of him. I mean, you know, obviously he's had a couple of faux pas in the past, every driver has, but yeah. not to that Level. extent. Not to that level of a driver of that experience. Oh, it just seemed to be like every session he was yeah. off the track or in the wall or something. So, yep. yeah, look, um, yeah, he just couldn't have done it on a worse on a worse weekend for himself. Um, he's got to bounce back and and get into Azerbaijan and hit the ground running. Otherwise, uh, yeah, the 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 bulls will be lining up at the gate to to have his head. I'll go as far as saying he'll win Azerbaijan. Well, you're a game man. I am a game man, but he's won every street circuit in the last two years. You, uh, so his form is predict is predictor. Yeah, look, he's going to take some luck. He'll need Max Verstappen to blow a tire uh, randomly again to um, to win nice. this one. But you're <laughs> making be, yeah. you're making some big predictions. Carlos getting his points back and uh, and Perez winning Azerbaijan. You'll still be in Perth, won't you? When uh, for the, for that Grand Prix? E, no, because it's coming up this week, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'll okay. be in Perth. Yep. If it happens and he gets the, and he gets his fourth place back, don't look at your phone. <laughs> Do not look at your phone. Do not look at your phone. Um, Alex Albon. Oh, man. What a mistake. He was on sixth and then, yeah, just got that little slide happening and, and wrote the thing off. So, yep. Yeah. Look, uh, Williams are good, though. Williams look strong. Williams are, um, are, are constantly fighting for the points and Alex, Alex is driving the wheels off the thing. So, um, like that's good to see if, if there's any positives to take for them. Um, that's that that would be it. That they they were there and actually in sixth place and holding their own. Yep, yep. No, I couldn't agree with you more. And and it's just a pity that with Alex, there's so much potential there. And it's either was he pushing too hard and made that mistake, but those those little errors have crept in from time to time yep. as well. And he's been in the game long enough now that you know, and being a lead driver in that team. He shouldn't be making those those sorts of mistakes. Well, he dropped a wheel. He dropped his left rear wheel off the edge of the curb coming out of turn five before going into turn six. So mm. um, a little bit of dirt, a little, little less grip on the tyres, and I think that's what's caused him to, to have the rotation there. Yeah. What, what were you, obviously, second year in, what were your thoughts on Melbourne now that they've had four DRS? And they may as well make the whole track DRS. I mean... <laughs> Just leave it open. Yeah. Um, look, the racing's obviously good because you get into those... DRS trains, but yeah, the passing, um, the passing doesn't happen when there's a DRS train because everyone's just got the same benefit. So I don't know whether there needs to be some other um, rules put in place for that when they get into a DRS train or whatever. But um, yeah, like it would have been nicer to see a bit more overtaking. Um, obviously, it's more than what we've had there in the past before the new track. But um, yeah, 
Yeah, no, look, it's good. At least it's looking like there's going to be more passing in the future. And the F2 and F3 races were sick too. They were great. They were very, very good. My um, my takeaway, well, my brother's takeaway, I should say, was that the F, he said the F3 cars were the loudest at the whole track. He goes, they were ridiculously loud. Yeah. yeah, that's been the way for quite some time. I remember when I went to Hockenheim uh, in like 2016 maybe, um, you couldn't hear uh, FP1 when FP1 was on the track and we were walking to the track. And then like they, about an hour later, um, F3 came out on track and you could hear them clear as day. Um, so, yeah, they are the loudest cars and it's like they get progressively quieter the further they get up the chain. <laughs> isn't that funny? Isn't it better to be the other way around? Yeah, like it should that? be, yeah. yeah. Even Carrera Cup's louder than, than Formula 1. Oh, it, which is a shame. Yeah. I don't think we'll ever... I, I still don't understand why they can't... If they're going to run hybrid, run hybrid, but run a V10 or a V12 or, or a V10 hybrid. Yeah. What's the difference? You know, yeah. at least you get the noise. Oh, well, you get four extra cylinders, you're burning more fuel, it's less uh, less carbon emissions, crucial or whatever critical. I don't know. Yeah, they're trying to, you know, save the planet, save the earth. <sighs> but they'll still take the most out-of-the-way routes to get between Grand Prix around the world and, and spend... You know, two hundred and something thousand miles of jet fuel in the air. But yeah, yeah. Hey, who are we kidding? <laughs> but I, I just think you know what the teams will find a way. Yeah, the engine, the engine manufacturers will find a way. Yep. That's why they're engine manufacturers. They'll find a way. <laughs> give, it, give us the noise and give us the the sound and uh, cut down on your emissions by flying the transport or flying all the freight in the most logical, sensical way from Europe to around the world. Yeah, or at least set up the calendar that it just flows on from one point to the next, yep. Yep. like. Albert Park should be prior to Singapore. Yep. You know, yep. or um, rather than going to do the Americas all in one hit. So don't have Miami in May and then Las Vegas in October. You know, do it so that way they're all, all interconnected and it's just, you know, it's logical. Yeah. So, but that was Melbourne. That was the wrap on that. As Bayern is not too far away. Uh, your predictions? Well, I'll look, Verstappen, Perez, Alonso. Um, Maybe honourable mentions from Russell, um, but that's that's yeah that's where it's going to be for the next few rounds. I think. I think it'll be a chaotic race. We're due for one, like as in like as a Bayern chaotic, not this fast that we had <laughs> at uh, at Albert Park. I, I, I sense an upset, but I think Perez will actually do it. Yeah, um, mainly because of the fact that he's got a, such a strong track record on street tracks at the moment. But, um, yeah, and a jumbled up order would be nice just to keep the championship spicy. I think uh, Max needs to have a, a Barry Crocker just to liven it up a little bit. I mean, we know it's a formality who will likely win it this year because yeah. the car's just that good. Um, but, yeah, Perez for me. And then whoever, second, third, don't care after that. <laughs> but I, I think uh, Sergio will, uh, will come good. We're off to a break. And then uh, we've got a round the world trip to take and then uh, a little bit of Q&A, I think, that will come up as well. Radio Italia Uno. You're listening to Negative Camber, sponsored by True Steel Frames, providing steel frames and roof trusses for any size projects. TrueSteelFrames.com.au Welcome back to Negative Camber, the motorsport show, proudly brought to you by True Steel Frames and proudly supported by the Scuderia Ferrari Club Adelaide as well. <laughs> hope you're enjoying the show so far. An hour down already. It's uh, it's absolutely flying and hope you – and thank you for those that are sending a couple of texts that are listening in. Um, appreciate the feedback. Glad you enjoyed Formula 1 being up front initially rather than karting, which was uh, something a little bit different. We always like to keep things fresh here at the show. Speaking of fresh, before we uh, – punch our tickets into the queue and take a trip around the world with Mr. Lee Dot Harrison. I posed a question to Lee during the week, and I can't remember whether we've actually done this previously. I can't remember. But I always thought, what what were your top five, your own personal top five drivers of all time, your top five tin top drivers, and then, say, your top five idols or people that you looked up to or aspire to or whatever just out of curiosity because i don't know sometimes you find that it 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 starts to sort of show a little bit about you as to who the sort of person that you are but also who you know even just 
maneuvers on the track or how you conduct yourself and that type of thing as well is um it, it gives you a bit of a snapshot as to who influenced you when you when you're younger so i'll let you go first i oh, like i said to you the other day i don't really have any idols there's like no one that i've had a hundred million pictures of in my bedroom and i've really tried to model my life around them um outside of old trafford because you've got the model. <laughs> yeah. Outside of, you know, it's just my favourite football team and, and they did a, happened to do a Lego model, which was nice. Um, but so I've done top five open wheeler drivers. I've gone a little bit outside the box. Yep. Um, and in not really in any particular order, uh, we've got Raikkonen, mm-hmm. Mansell, Hill, uh, that's Damon, yep. Alonso and Greg Moore. Greg Moore. Greg Moore. Wow, there you go. There's yeah. a name from the... Man, what an unlucky way to go. Absolutely. That was horrific. Absolutely. Horrific. I was watching that race live when uh, when that happened, and it was it was a very sad day. I yeah. actually did really like jumping on and watching the Indy cars and, and watching Greg Moore drive in the, in the player's Indy car. It was really fun, cool, but uh, really damn cool. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Whoops. But yeah, so top five, Raikkonen. Well, yeah, no, no particular order. Raikkonen, uh, Mansell Hill, Alonso, Greg Moore. I did something very similar, all right, very similar because it's like F1's quite quite specific. So I went open wheeler because obviously you got that Indy Indy car, especially when we were younger and kart back in the day, mm-hmm. which was Indy car, was like amazing. Mm-hmm. So for me, top five: Ayrton Senna, Gilles Villeneuve, Jacques Villeneuve, Sebastian Vettel, and then it's actually Damon Hill. Hand on heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I fell in love with Damon after Senna passed away. Mm-hmm. So that, that 94, 95 period. However, it was very hard for me to keep top five. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Zanardi's up there. Yep. Um, and then obviously Shui. Yeah. Well, so I really branched out because I couldn't think of anyone else I wanted to put in the top five and in, in keeping it in F1. But. You know, when I put Greg Moore on there, it took away the likes of Zanardi. It took away the likes of Jimmy Vassa. Yep. Um, it's taken away someone like Jeff Gordon and, and that sort of stuff as well. But, uh, but yeah, it was tricky. Like you said, as uh, top five is hard work. Yeah, that's the thing. And it's like you feel guilty having to leave them out. That's why I had yeah. to do mentions. But, man, how, it's funny. Alex Zanardi started off in Lotus, 92, 93, was just a name on a sheet. Yep. Goes to IndyCar, has the career of careers and is an absolute out-and-out superstar, comes back to Williams and struggled with the groove tyres and, and the narrow track and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. With that. And admittedly, the Williams wasn't that Thank great. Yep. Then goes back and then has just that horrifying accident over in, in Germany, uh, which was that was it the twin ring? Lausitz ring. Lausitz ring. But then he's had such a phenomenal... And then, obviously, he had that horrific accident going back a couple of years ago with uh, when he was riding his... Well, he's a bit Push of Paralymp- yeah, yeah, Paralympian. Just an amazing individual. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Tragedy that he couldn't really hit a big in, uh, Formula, in Formula, Formula 1. Yeah, yeah, 100%. But that car era in the early 90s, early late 90s, man, yeah. that was amazing. Yeah, him, Jimmy Vassar, Greg Moore all going out at Hammer and Tongs. Yeah, Emerson Fittipaldi. Yeah. The Andretti's. Christian Fittipaldi. Yeah. The Andretti's, yeah. Yeah, the Andretti's. Alonzo Jr. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the old days. They were good. They were good. Tin tops. Yeah. So, I've got Lowndes. Then we head across uh, into some BTC action with uh, Jason Plato and Elaine Menu. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then... I've got Kyle Larson on here as well uh, with – and then uh, the next one's – I've got an equal fifth, so we're going to go with six. I've got Bern Schneider uh, from DTM fame yep. and Jeff Gordon. Yeah, fair enough. Yep. Um, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't split them. Yeah, I, I struggled too, man. Um, personal top five note, no, no surprise. Mark Scaife, Jim Richards, Alan Moffat, Peter Brock, and then Ricard Rydell, mm-hmm. BDCC. But then – Dale Earnhardt. That's yeah. fair. Dale Earnhardt, the Intimidator. Yep. Um, man, but that was hard. That was hard. Because like, oh, then you forget Craig Lowndes, you forget, you know, and then you could branch out BTCC like Ali Manu. Um, if you ever get an opportunity, if I, if I dig it out of my archives, I should lend you the 97 Bathurst 1000, the two-liter era. And if you get you see the opening stint of Jason Plato when he started that race in that Renault Laguna, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm reading I'm reading his uh, biography at the moment, uh, Jason Plato. So it'll be on the on the reading list while we'll, uh, I'm parked up for the evenings um, in, in my many stops on the way to and from 
WA, but uh, yeah, he was him. And uh, when him and Menu used to go hammer and tongs in the Renaults, um, you know, the the Magan and the Laguna, and yeah, the old British Racing Green Nestle paint job. Yep. Um, yeah, that was the BTCC days that I was growing up with, and yeah, I used to love watching that racing. Peak BTCC era, yeah, absolutely. the best, absolute best. But do yourself a favour, watch that stint. It's one of the all time great stints of of a Bathurst one thousand. I actually then did a, a top five of my all-time sporting idols, influences, or whatever, and that was even harder. Yep. Um, so, Ed and Senna, first up, Mark Scaife, Roger Federer, hence the hair. Um, and then it got really difficult, uh, and your darling wife will enjoy this one. Uh, couldn't split it. LeBron James, Michael Jordan, because mm-hmm. I love me a bit of basketball, mm-hmm. being an old player myself. And then Lance Armstrong. Yeah, irrespective, so you're like you're like a cheater. Well, yeah, okay, you could go down that path, but we what people ignore is, uh, I think what makes it worse is the fact that it was the story before that, the fact that he was knocking on death's door, hmm. lung cancer, brain cancer, testicular cancer, ten percent chance he was gone, survived it, then came back and ended up winning seven Tour de France in a row. I don't care, the record still stands, but because of who he was and just like just how systematic that I mean doping was rife that that top ten of the Tour de France of all of his years they were all yeah. up to the gills in EPO he just did it better than everyone else and because of the profile that he had and the fact that he's obviously American as well just rubbed the French up the wrong way <laughs> um, and and he's been you know because guys like Marco Pantani Jan Ulrich all those other cyclists they're still lauded as gods you know and they were just as bad yeah you know so. Uh, Lance just, but Lance got me on the bike, like you know. Um, yeah, he's cool. I like him. Um, have you got a top five? No, nah, like I said, I don't really have any idols. But I guess if you had to just go full sports people, mm. then MJ's up there, of course. Um, growing up watching him, Shaq, um, and then yeah, Mansell um, would be up there. He was he was my go to guy because you know he did the crossover between IndyCar and Formula mm. One and did it super well. Probably then Villeneuve as well. Um, I used to sit and watch him a fair bit. Um, I mean, yeah, that would be sort of pushing it. Like that's a, that's about it. Yeah. Did you go through that phase like I did at, in say '97 when Jacques bleached his hair and you wanted to bleach your hair? Blood? Uh, I'd bleached hair. Yeah, I'd bleached hair, bleached tips, did all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. different colours in my hair. But I was going through it like that was rife through school when I went to school. So yeah, I was just keeping up with the, the trends. Yeah, I had to just fantasise about it because there was no way that I could get in an Italian household that I could come back with peroxide blonde hair. Yeah. Nah, I, I probably wouldn't be alive today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's interesting. It's actually funny that we had a lot of similarities there too. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great minds. Hey? Yeah, exactly. All right, all right, come on. Takes around the world, my friend. All right, and we will start off with my favourite go-to category here in Around the World with NASCAR racing. We've had three races uh, in the NASCAR Cup Series with races held at Circuit of the Americas, Richmond Raceway, uh, and then the dirt race at Bristol Motor Speedway last weekend. Tyler Reddick won a very exciting race at Cota with multiple late race cautions and green-white checker attempts. Uh, with refueling an option in NASCAR, they have a race until the leader takes the white flag policy, whereby then the next flag would end the race. Reddick survived three separate restart attempts and held off Kyle Busch and Alex Bowman. It was not a great race for the two ex-Formula 1 race drivers, with Button placing 19th and Raikkonen in 29th after earlier running inside the top 10. In the Richmond race, Kyle Larson beat home his Hendrick Motorsport teammate Josh Berry, who was driving the number 9 car, filling in for an injured Chase Elliott. Ross Chastain was classified third. Christopher Bell showed his knowledge of dirt surfaces and came out on top in the dirt race held at Bristol with Tyler Reddick and Austin Dillon rounding out the top three. Kyle Larson was looking strong at the front, but an uncharacteristic mistake saw him spin out of contention for the race win. AJ Allmendinger and Chandler Smith were, were victorious in the Xfinity races held at Coda and Richmond, while in the Craftman Truck Series it was Zane Smith winning at Coda with Carson Hosevar at Texas and Joey Logano at Bristol. Uh, IndyCar, IndyCar, we have Joseph Newgarden has won his third Texas Motor Speedway race, this time under caution after an epic battle with Pato Award. Such was the domination by these two drivers that on lap 160 of the 250 lap race, they were actually the only two drivers on the lead lap. 
with 68 laps, laps left to go. Uh, a caution came out when Rosenquist made contact with the wall under the yellow award and Newgarden pitted while the rest of the field took the wave around to get back on the lead lap. Newgarden then pitted a second time to top his tank up while Award stayed out, meaning that he would need to save a little bit of fuel on the run home. An intense battle ensued uh, with about 10 laps to go. There were seven drivers in for a chance at the win, and after some more go- cautions, Newgarden came out on top with Award second and Alex Pillow third. Scott McLaughlin came home in sixth place. The first ever Australian rounds of the FIA F2 and F3 Championship races were held alongside round three of the Formula One Championship that we spoke about earlier. In FIA F2, it was Dennis Hauger and Ayumu Iwasa who shared the wins in the sprint and feature races respectively. Hauger held off Jack Crawford and Kush Maini in a weather-interrupted sprint race, while in the feature race, Iwasa held off Poucher and Arthur Leclerc. Iwasa now leads the championship by eight points over Poucher, who has a further eight points ahead of Freddie Vesti. Jack Doohan had a weekend to forget after earlier setting the pace in a practice session. He now sits 11th in the championship, 26 points adrift of the lead. In F3, it was Zach O'Sullivan and Gabriel Bortolotto who shared the victories in the sprint and feature races. Franco Colapinto had won the sprint race on the road but was later disqualified for a technical infringement. All three MP motorsport cars were found to have had their kills modified from the regulations set out in the technical regs. Zach O'Sullivan was followed home by Sebastian Montoya, the son of former former, former Formula One driver Juan Pablo, and Paul Aron. Bortolotto has now won back-to-back feature races after he held off the man with the best name in motorsport, Gregoire Saucy, and Gabriel <laughs> Mini. Bortolotto is now 20 points clear of Saucy in the championship, with Dino Boganovic sitting in third place, a further 10 points behind. And I know you did try and stitch me up with some WEC uh, news, possibly, but their race is only just starting, so the WEC race uh, information will have to wait until next next show, unfortunately. No stitch up at all, my friend. It was um, I wasn't aware of time differences and stuff, but however, if anyone has seen the horrific... Uh, actually, it has been a pretty tumultuous week for motorsport. We yeah. must be said there was... Um, now, who was it that passed away in the Speedway? Uh, Justin Owen passed away in a sprint car crash on, like, Monday, maybe? Yep, yep. Um, and they talk about how the accident happened? Uh, it was just a freak accident. Yeah. Yep. One of those things that happens. Yep. Ridiculous. Yep. You're going fast and rides a wheel and gets a you get some air and crashes the wrong way and you're done. Yep. And then you had Breen from uh, Hyundai... Hello. Uh, yep. In the World Rally Championship as well, testing yep. of all things. And then yep. there was another yeah. guy in Speedway that is uh, is not doing too good at the moment as well. He had a big crash in qualifying. Yep, yep. It's been a been a rough week. It's um, there hasn't been a death in World Rally Championship for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Very long time. Actually, there's so many drivers that you could put in that top five that influenced when I was a kid. Like even Carlos Sainz, like rally driver right, Carlos yep. Sainz, yep. El Matador. Um, you are Kankinen. Oh God, I go through. Uh, was it uh, Tommy Mackinnon? Tommy Mackinnon. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And th- those guys have they can drive. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but no, horrific to see that uh, happen. It's never good when that happens because it just pause- it gets you to sort of take a step back, pause, and reflect, mm-hmm. and think. Oh God, yeah, it is. We we take it for granted. Absolutely. Um, even yep. when we race ourselves. Yep. So, and then like you were going to touch on that crash with the uh, the Porsche ending yeah. up in the in the grandstand at Porto Mal as well. I so part of my role, obviously, uh, with the Ferrari Club, there's I'm on a chat, which is where all the global presidents um, sort of talk and communicate and that sort of thing as well. And one of them was actually at Porto Mal and nearby. So he took photos of the aftermath and shared it amongst the group. It's horrific. I mean, there was no one in the grandstands there, thank, thankfully. Yeah, thank but fuck. how can um, how can you actually just yeah, uh, just the speed and land up in a grandstand like that with the modern safety features that they've got? Horrific accident. Yeah, I mean, you look at uh, even Silverstone last year with Guan Yu. He, that's so close to ending up in the catch fencing um, in, in the sta- in the stands as well. So 
like motorsport, we can, you know, we can put all of the safety measures in place, but there's always going to be that one one percent thing that might happen, and that's that's unfortunately why you've got to put that that risk statement on the back of every ticket that you sell, saying that the motorsport is dangerous. And oh, you look at that fan as well in Melbourne that got hit in the uh, the arm by a piece of um, yep. flying debris from Kevin Magnuson's car. Like yep. it's just the way that it went up. You can't build catch fencing for stuff that goes twenty foot into the air. You, you the tracks that look silly. Yeah, absolutely. So actually, speaking of people, how poor form were, were we as as a country to have those idiots trying to run onto the track whilst the race was still going ahead? And that's people that sort of they don't know fully yet what the what the go is. So and and it should have been marshaled a bit better, I suppose. Like obviously there was not enough um, authority there to stop the people running onto the track. And like you said, they got onto the track um, while there was still cars moving around and. They got to within arm's distance of Nico Hockenberg's car that had um, stopped out on track and was in an unsafe, um, you know, energy mode. So that if anyone had touched the car, they they could have had you know however many thousands of volts going through them. But uh, yeah, it wasn't a very it wasn't a very good um, image for Australia to have. Um, so all those people should be ashamed of themselves. Um, it's been a very very long time since a, a Grand Prix promoter has been called to see the stewards uh, after the race, and, and unfortunately that was Australia that broke that duck. Yeah, I, I just think with, with with the volume of PA that they've got in terms of the PA systems, the fact that they've got a plethora of screens going around, the spectators have got no excuse. Like, like there is no excuse to be able to run onto the track when it's very, very clear that there's a race going on, and it's very, very clear. It's not the Bathurst 1000 where you turn around going out of Hell Corner and straight into the pit lane at the end of the race. Yeah, you know, like they they've still got to do their cool down lap and then pull into the podium as well. I think there was still some like there was obviously it was such a confusing way that that race ended as well. Um, that didn't help things. So fans thought that. When they had gone past, that was their cool down lap, and that was the race that was finished. They didn't realise that there was another lap that had to come. They didn't. There was no course car that came out to say that the track was safe, so no one knew. Blah blah blah. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, just just unfortunately a calamity of errors at the end of the race there. Yeah, when you being on the other side of the fence from your time in Miami, what what would be the consequence, or what would happen if a race steward was or a race organiser was called in? for an on-track discretion of that nature. So what would be, say, the um, uh, the process thereafter? Well, there's obviously a... Um, like, you go to the stewards um, and, and then the FIA has their say on what they want to do. Um, it depends on how serious the breach is. So they've obviously entered into a, an agreement with... Um, the, the Australian Grand Prix Corporation that they're going to have a review into what happened and then they're going to have to come up with a detailed plan as to how it's never going to happen again. Um, and I guess like at the end of the day, worst case scenario is if the FIA aren't satisfied that the, the event can go un- ahead in a safe condition, they just won't hold the event. Um, so yeah, everyone's just got to sort of stop and think that that is what the action can be. Mm. Um, so if you want to keep having the Grand Prix held in your backyard, then, then make sure you abide by the rules. And again, the same thing with us in Miami. We had so many screens, so many people at gates. We had only certain gates where people could then enter the track for what we called the, the track invasion or whatever we were called, the track rush. Um, and and we were only letting people in through that gate. So there was less uh, less ways of getting into the, the circuit and, and it was clearly... Um, clearly signalled on all the screens and over all the PAs that it was when the course car went past that spot, then we would open the track and, and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, look, I wasn't there on the ground in, in Melbourne, so we can't see exactly what happened, so we don't have all the answers. But, um, but yeah, that, uh, that was the process that we had going. Yeah. It's been nearly 12 months since uh, your stint in Miami. Miss it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. It's like obviously they're getting really really close with um, all the build up and stuff. So I'm basically in. I'm still in a chat group with all the guys and, and girls from Miami. So um, it's probably bi daily now. Um, mm. I get a I get a message and an update of how things are going and how things are looking. So yeah, it sort of it sort of tugs a little bit, and I want to be back there. You know, jump on the plane tomorrow if we could and get back there. But it's not saying that I'm not happy where I am either. So I'm I'm happy doing what I'm doing. You stay back in Adelaide and want to spend more time with your wife and still don't see her much. Yeah. <laughs> what you were yeah, saying well, before. Yeah. <laughs> well, that ship's in the night at the moment. It's oh, been pretty crazy. So I don't envy you guys in that regard. Just the way that the, the calendars have lined up. She's been so busy and then she gets home on a weekend and then I've got go-karts or we've got the come and try day. So we've got to be there for work and 
yeah, it's just been flat knacker, and then obviously, yeah, off to Perth this week, so that's another week and a half. But yeah, we got the we got the Easter weekend and got to spend a whole weekend and or five days, I think it was, together, um, which was nice and and good time to catch up. And yeah, well, mm. yeah, it'll it'll come back around. I actually pray pray that we don't exceed the on track accidents uh, in this round of AKC compared to what they did at round one. Oh, look, I. I don't want to hold my breath on that one. <laughs> yeah, it's, I know you were critical of the driver standards from that race, from yeah, that round. Yeah, look, a bit of patience never goes astray, but yeah, it's everyone's going to be learning a new track. The passing's going to be, you know, no one's going to know it um, except for the locals. So, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. And there's a lot on the, a lot on the line. So, um, you know, nearly nearly every class is oversubscribed. So. Hopefully that means that everyone will drive a bit more sensibly and, and know that if they do have one or two bad races, it means that they're not going to make the final. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we'll see it, but I'm not going to hold my breath. Mm. Speaking of karting, we've got a new guest coming in uh, next next fortnight, Tim Harrell from Technocarts, you know, Timmy. Loyal listener to the show, father of Dr. Dez. Timmy. Timmy. Timmy's going to come on the show, and it's actually good because it coincides with uh, be roughly about the Anzac Day or there or thereabouts, and uh, Tim actually served in the military, mm-hmm. so plenty of stories to tell, young Tim. Looking forward to him. He was um, he was actually going to, meant to make his uh, return to the driver's seat at uh, Barossa with his uh, was techno with four strokes, so yep. uh, we enticed TH back, so that'll be interesting to... Um, yeah, I'll be keen to see how he goes. Um, but yeah, you know, the fa- the whole family's got a history and a family tree of racing, so yeah, yeah, he no, won't struggle. Tim was racing when I first started racing, so he's an old dog. Um, it won't take him long to. It's just like riding a bike. As soon as he gets back in the seat, and he's done a fair bit of um, vintage stuff as well, so it's not like he's been completely out of the seat forever. Um, but yeah, he'll, he'll be right. Yeah, I'm keen to hear some of his stories when he's in the force. Yeah, he'll have, in like, he'll he'll have heaps of stories, force and, and in go-karts as well. Ooh, <laughs> that means going to be digging a shovel and dirt on you. No, I don't know. I don't know how much you'll have on me. I don't know. We'll see. See how much he remembers. You'll be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing will ever beat the Dylan Richter surprise that Tom was here in the <laughs> Loved studio. it. Loved it. <laughs> have we got a long tool break or... So three minutes? Yeah. Oh, okay. What do you reckon? We reckon we have a crack at MotoGP now? Yeah. We've got sure. enough time? Yeah, we've got five minutes. All right. Let's let's uh, let's talk MotoGP. And uh, the round two. Oh, round two. I don't want to know about round two. <laughs> I don't want to know about round two. El Gran Premio de la Argentina at Termas de Rio Hondo. Round two of the MotoGP World Championship was held in very, very wet conditions. Fantastic result if you were Ducati. Heartbreaking if you were on the Peco show. These are the highlights. It's time to tango in MotoGP here in Termas. A great launch from pole position by Alex Marquez. Bagnaia got away really well too on the number one bike. Betsecki's going to squeeze on the inside of Morbidelli into the first corner. He does indeed. Betsecki in position A. He gets the front at turn one. Brett Binder obviously not making the same level of progress yesterday. Only up 2 to 13th. But he is ahead of Maverick Vinales. He is 14th. Oh, Brad Binder's Binder. gone down. Brad Binder has crashed out. Then so there, is, there will not be any repeats of his stunning sprint success yesterday from 15th to 1st in that oh! incredible sprint. Quattararo gets tagged there as well. Is that Nakagami yeah. flying through into turn number 7? There's as much action already here as we had in the sprint yesterday. So Brad Binder down and out on the very first lap after his sprint success yesterday. And as Quattararo, he's been dropped all the way back to 16th place. Now the last of the runners. Here is what happened to Brad Binder into turn 5. Yeah, into turn 5. Really tricky braking zone, isn't it, that one? And on the inside of him, is it Maverick Vinales? He just got clipped there, didn't Ralph Fernandez was really forced on the outside. This is what happened into turn seven. It's Taka and Nakagami that comes up the inside of us. There he is and forces Quattararo off onto the very slick runoff. Nerfed by Nakagami without any question. Nakagami was very, very aggressive there. Wasn't on that LCR Honda on the brakes on the first lap into turn seven. Did Gian Antonio getting involved with that? He started his Grand Prix in 14th position. He's already made up half the distance from himself to the front. He runs seven. Miller and Zarco, they're having a right good old ding dong here, aren't they? This is the fight. Uh, for seventh place at the moment he's going the way of the Australian he's starting to make forward progress he started from way down in 16th place so it's been a strong start for the Grand Prix for Miller something's happened here to Jorge Martin 
this is going to be a little... He went wide going into oh. 14 and then out of the seat. We look at this battle raging between Rins, the Gian Antonio and Zarco. This is into turn number seven. Rins on the inside of Digia. He makes that through nicely. Miller now attacking Martin of the Hill into turn number nine. Positions chopping and changing further down the field. But it's as you were at the front of this race. But Seki leads for Marquez and Bagnaia. Martin back through on Miller through turn 11 that time. This one's going to run and run. Oh, look at that by Zarco on the inside of Rins going through turn number 11. Riding on board now with the world champion again. Able to take a tighter line than Alex Marquez. At the moment, it looks as if Marquez is much more on the limit than Bagnaia. And now he's watching him go past him. Yeah, you wonder whether this is just a little bit more expertise and knowledge of the, the bike in the rain on this, isn't it? Pekka Bagnaia, this is his fifth season on the catch. Oh, Alex Marquez, oh. though, he's not that even have that second place, is he, for free? Bagnaia finds a way back through into turn number 13. Through they come. It has, he has got the inside line. Nothing that Alex Marquez can do about that, then. Oh, oh Bagnaia's gone down. down. Can you believe it? Just out the corner of our picture there, Pekka Bagnaia has made a mistake, a big, big mistake. He was in second place, couple of laps after he passed Alex Marquez. And the number one in the gravel trap here, head in hands for Davide Tardozzi. We saw this on more than one occasion, didn't we, last season, towards the first part of 2022, when he got dropped 91 points at one stage after the German Grand Prix by Fabio Quattararo. Old habits die hard sometimes, and Bagnaia crashes out of second place. High drama here in Argentina. It's less than that now. Oh, it's Morbidelli was wide. He was on the paintwork there, wasn't he? Couldn't get the power on as he ran on the slippery paint, and Zarco just eases on through. But Zarco not finished just yet. Next in his sights is Marquez for second. Zarco just able to get the power down out of turns three and four as he tries to pull alongside Alex Marquez. He'll look to pick up a little bit of slip through now. He's not even bothering with it, is he? He's up the inside line. He can break so much later than Alex Marquez, who shakes his head. He's got no answer for it. Absolutely awesome job this by Zarco. He's come from so far back. I'm going to love to look at the analysis after this race and see how far back he was in terms of position and in terms of times. It's been a rousing recovery by the Frenchman. It has been a Marco Bezzecchi masterclass here in Argentina. Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to witness history. He comes through to 13, he powers through turn 14. Marco Bezzecchi is the MotoGP winner for the very first time here in Argentina. Valentino Rossi is a race winning team owner for the first time in MotoGP. That was what Valentino Rossi created this team for to give Italian talent in MotoGP. What a day in the history of Valentino Rossi's Ducati team and Marco Bezzecchi, the best day of his life without any question. He's the race winner in MotoGP for the very first time and a bonus, he's the new MotoGP World Championship leader as well. Congratulations to Bez, congratulations to the doctor. Uh, and there you have it, the round two of the MotoGP held at, I just love saying it, the El Gran Premio de Argentina at Termas del Rio Hondo. So, uh, just Rio Hondo. Rio Hondo. Rio Hondo. Fantastic. Rio Hondo. What a way, what a way to sort of announce a track like that. Uh, I'll quickly do the, uh, the top 10 before we go on to a break and then we'll talk a little bit about, uh, MotoGP. Marco Bezzecchi first, Johan Zarco second, Alex Marquez third, Franco Morbidelli surprise fourth, but well, well overdue. My boy Jorge Martin fifth, Jack Miller sixth, Fabio Quadraro in seventh place, Luca Marini eighth, Alex Rins ninth, and Fabio Di Gian Antonio in tenth position. So they were the the highlights of the event. We'll talk a little bit of Mojo GP, Mojo GP, Mojo GP. Yeah, that's like saucy. Mm -hmm. uh, after a break. You're listening to Negative Camber, sponsored by True Steel Frames, providing steel frames and roof trusses for any size projects. TrueSteelFrames.com.au Welcome back to Negative Camber, the motorsport show, proudly brought to you by True Steel Frames and proud supporters of the Scuderia Ferrari Club of Adelaide. A35 this evening. I thought it was actually going to be cold. Well, it is a little bit cold and wet. It's chilly. Well, it's it not chilly. Yeah. It is chilly. Not wet. Not it was wet yesterday, still. though. No, My very God. wet yesterday. Man, if you were a duck, you'd be flying in yesterday's deluge of, uh, of weather. But uh, there you go. Did you realize none of us picked it up? But last week's show, well, the last uh, uh, show introduction, I actually said Friday night, but we were in the studio on Sunday. 
<laughs> I'm gonna have to go back and listen to that. Yeah, like Bianca and uh, and my sister in law picked up. She goes, "You said Friday," and I'm like, "No." Nah. <laughs> I said, "Lee would pull me up on it straight away." She goes, "No, no, no." Look, we we swear. I'm like, "Nah." I said, "You guys are hearing things." Yeah. Sure enough, listen to the replay. Said a Friday. There you go. There you go. And you didn't pick it up, no. and um, Cocker didn't pick no, it up. No, no one picked it up. We were just too busy having a good time to, yeah. to pick it up. Or well, you don't pay attention to what I say. It's one, <laughs> it's one or the other. Tuned out a long time ago. Oh, oh, there you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, the Peco Show. <laughs> back to MotoGP. I feel like if we rewound back to our review after round one of MotoGP, I believe I would have said something along the lines of, it's only round one. And it won't be long before he throws himself down the track again. Shh. That was round two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's, yep. uh, oh, look. It. What, what can I say? Like at the end of the day, it's it's one of those things. He's he hasn't had a spill since Japan last year. I'll give the benefit of the doubt. He turned it around at Circuit of Americas overnight in the qualifying race. He's mm-hmm. got pole, won won the sprint race. So. Peko's good. It's, it's just wet weather. Up. I heard. I uh, just read a, a crazy, crazy piece of news that uh, Alex Marquez crashed out of the race after he vomited in his helmet. Really? Yep. Ooh. Nah. <laughs> that would not be very tasty. Oh, you know, yeah, that. So he's done a case of the Webbers. Yeah, exactly. Oh, could yep. you imagine? Oh, no, thank you. Noth- vomiting in your helmet, or if you've had to, if you've had to, sort of a one or a two or whatever in, in your overalls, if you're like racing as well. Yep. I've heard stories of that. Oh, I definitely heard ones, not so many twos, but yep. Yeah, yeah, I've okay. heard I've heard of a number two done. Yeah, right. Yeah. Love that. No, not really. Let's bring this back on track. Let's bring this back to <laughs> uh, anyway, back on track quickly. It's gone out of control already. We're getting to that point of the mm-hmm. night. Um Betseki as well. Uh he well how how can you beat your first win in conditions like that? Yeah. And then to don the Argentina national a national team top, autograph by Lionel Messi. Exactly the same as Valentina Rossi back in 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, not bad. Absolutely. Yeah. You didn't watch it, so... I'll no. Just, I'll yeah, just you're, you're, you're on your own here, on unfortunately. Here. Yeah, you're riding this bike. Franco Morbidelli... Oh, well done. Well played. <laughs> uh, Franco Morbidelli, resurgent, giving Yamaha signs of hope, but uh, they're, they're in Struggle Street. I, they've addressed the issue for straight line speed, no dramas, but the bike all of a sudden just can't handle, and Fabio Quadraro cannot get to grips with it. He spilled it overnight last night yeah. uh, in the sprint race as well. So they're in, they're in all sorts... They're, they're the Honda of, what, of two years ago now. Where Honda have literally just the the wheels have fallen off, yeah. literally. Um, well, they're starting to get back on top of it again now, though, and it's Ducati's time to shine. So it seems like there's this cyclical. Uh, if you look back at the history of MotoGP, it's a cyclical thing: at Ducati and then Honda and then Yamaha and then back to Ducati, back to Yamaha, back to Honda. So yeah, they'll all come back around again. Oh look, it, Honda doesn't take this sort of stuff um, seriously. I like they don't likely. take like likely and yep. lightly, I should say. Um, so yeah, they'll be they're desperate, hopefully for Mia to to get to grips with the bike. But now Marquez is out for another couple of races too. Yep. So there um, seems to be a lot of injuries in MotoGP this this yeah. season. Um, there was there's three riders out. Uh, I think it's Bastianini's out as well this weekend, yep. and yep. Uh, uh, someone else mine's escaping me. But um, yeah, that's, that's the last time I heard of three riders out in the same same race is a long time ago. Well, the bikes are going faster than what they've ever done before. Yep. Like they're they're breaking lap records and you know reaching straight line speeds, the likes of which they've never seen. achieved and never seen before yeah you know so naturally given the the body structure and the protection hasn't hasn't changed there's going to come to a point where you're going to pass that threshold of surviving it yeah you know so my only concern is i hope that it doesn't result in a fatality at yep. some point at the top level before they really start to ask questions uh, exactly you know? right yeah um those guys yeah they're <laughs> We everyone's like F one F one, and you know how can you make a motorbike safe? No, you can't. You can't doing three hundred and fifty kilometers an hour on the fuel tank of a missile. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's not not. A, oh, I don't, I don't know how they do it, Paul. Yeah. still. Oh no, it's I'm incre- I mean, Can you imagine adrenaline rush though? Yeah, phenomenal. Um, and then of course nightmare for Aprilia as well with both Aspargaro and Vinales suffering um, some some very poor results as well. So yeah, look at some um, Peco's uh, this. Championship 
is going to be all about consistency. It's about nailing them because the points for the sprint race count towards yep. the title as well. Yep. So it's just ticking along points. But Seki's only leaving the title race by one point, um, but Banyaya would have been streets ahead already. So I'm just hoping that it doesn't become a case of um, a case of the Jacques Villeneuve of '97, where you and Williams, where you try to find a way to lose the yep. title rather than actually winning it. That's a curse for teams that you support in just in general, isn't oh, it? Ferrari, God, you know, Caddy. I don't know. It must be me. <laughs> There's no other way to to talk about that. It must be me. Yeah. So yeah. But uh, no, we will go through the results of and review that particular race as of the next show as well. So yeah, that race is four o'clock in the morning our time, I think, tomorrow at uh, Coda. So yeah, uh, it's going to be a early morning if you're a MotoGP fan. Yeah, normally a, a Mark Marquez, you could almost chalk that down as a guaranteed win. Yeah. Now that he's not there, but the Ducatis this year have been incredible. Yeah. Absolutely what, is incredible. Is it like the last eight or something in a row that Marquez had won at Coda? Yeah, he um, eight or nine or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, he'd inherited a nickname over King there of too, Coda. King of Coda, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So it's um, phenomenal record. I mean, I, I don't think there's been a rider before or since that's had such a strong. Like, Strangle I mean, you've had world. a couple of Australians like Casey Stoner or Wayne Gardner or Mick Doohan that have won a few Australian Grand Prix in a row, but not seven or eight. Yeah, that's unheard of. Uh, but it just seems just clicks, you yep. know. Um, so and sometimes some some drivers have that affinity with the track. Yeah. So yeah. Um, supercars. Yeah. Well. Okay. So we're down. What? We're two race two rounds two into rounds, yep. to the season. What have your thoughts been on Gen Three so far? They look good. Mm. They look good and they sound good, and it's good to see the flames come back. I don't think it's really changed much to do with the racing. Yeah. Um, but again, we didn't really get a race event at the Australian Grand Prix. We got a few crash fests and safety car and time certain finishes. Um, obviously, the the stuff with the Triple Eight cars getting excluded in the first race at Newcastle has helped build somewhat of an interesting championship. Um, Shane on the fight back with Erebus leading the championship at the moment as well. So, look, it's been it's been interesting, um, but I think. It's still going to take a couple of rounds to, to play out. I don't think that there's much to be said for the, the parity issues. I think it's pretty close um, for both cars. I just think you've got the teams that did the most work um, at, at the front. Well, it's it's funny you say that. So when uh, when I caught up with Charlie going back a couple of months ago now, I think it is, um, we talked about the fact that it's this year is all going to be a work in progress. At the end of the day, I look at it this way. You can have a parity-based class or racing formula like supercars but you've got two distinctly different body shapes mm-hmm. all right so you've got the monaro uh, sorry the monaro god the camaro which is somewhat blocky in its appearance and then you've got the the mustang which visually looks more aerodynamic and yet somehow you've got they're expecting the cars to perform exactly the same mm-hmm. when they've got vastly different body shapes and also aerodynamic features as well so it's never going to be 100% equal. It can't. It just physically can't. No matter how hard you try, mm-hmm. there's always going to be a, a point where it just there's got to be a point of difference. Yep. So I, I, um, the biggest takeaway for me in terms of that point is how unintelligent V8 supercar supporters actually are. Because <laughs> if you want something to drive you absolutely nuts in terms of craziness... Read the comment section after a race, yeah. right? And the cynicism and the smart aleck and just the plain dumb and stupid that comes out in, in all of those. So yeah. biggest takeaway is work in progress. They're working on it. They'll fix it. You will never get a better test session than what's actually racing. Yeah. You know, they can do as many laps around Queensland Raceway and straight line tests as you want, but it's only when you're actually in the field of battle will you really know the shortcomings of yeah. packages. Driving in the stuff. disturbed air and all that sort of jazz. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah. So let's... We'll go off to a break, and then when we come back, I want to talk about the Shane Van Gisbergen issue, but then also the fires that have been happening, because we've got a good piece from BJR that talks about what the issues might be for those issues that happened at the Australian Grand Prix. You're listening to Negative Camber, sponsored by True Steel Frames, providing steel frames and roof trusses for any size projects. TrueSteelFrames.com.au 
Welcome back to Negative Camper, the motorsport show, proudly brought to you by True Steel Frames and proud supporters of the Scuderia Ferrari Club of Adelaide. 15 minutes to go before show is over. We're talking V8 supercars now. Um, Newcastle, Shane Van Gisbergen, uh, massive fallout for that. Uh, far reaching. It had, um, some, some change and a lot of it stems from the fact about his conduct after race two and how he handled himself both in the direct aftermath of, uh, being interviewed by Jesse Yates and then also his conduct in the press conference, which then resulted in, uh, Jess, Mark Scaife and Garth Tander pretty much pulling his pants down and spanking him live on TV. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, uh, deservedly so. Uh, but then the ramifications that came from that after when Shane decided to open up two days later and give his piece of events and how he, uh, what he wanted to say as well, um, all of a sudden it caused a ripple effect where even Fox Sports had to change part of their broadcast lineup as well. Yep. What was your takeaway on that? Oh, uh, yeah, look, you know, you've just raced flat out for three hours of, of, of your day and... Some something's pretty gone, you know, a little bit haywire at the end, and and you just want to get get on with your day. Um, race car drivers aren't there to be paid to talk; they're there to pay paid to be racing go, uh, cars. So, um, I think you've just got to, as a reporter, sometimes as well, just remember that if if the question's not going to get answered, you can't push. Like, um, it'll all come out in the end, and and maybe that particular moment's not the, the moment that you need because, yeah, yeah, it's. You know, all the adrenaline's going. It's all pumping pretty hard, and and sometimes people say things that they don't want to, they don't really mean, or it comes out in the way that they know they know that they're going to get um, chastised for anyway. So it's better not to say anything. Mm. The um, oh look, I, I largely agree with what you're saying. However, um, I, I just think that irrespective, your, your conduct in front of TV, you're the one that you're the face of the team, face of the brand, face of all your sponsors, etc. You can't afford to be a douche no. on, on, on TV. Yeah, but he was polite about it. He said, you know, it was a good race for the team. The guys did a really good job and we worked hard and got, got to the front, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't like he was... The, the the stuff in the in the press conference was maybe a little bit different, but, I mean, again, he said, uh, that's that's all I'm going to say right now, and then they kept probing for more questions, and all he, all he said was, that I'm, I'm not going into any further details. Yep. And I think that as a sports person, that, that if you want to have that little moment of privacy, then so so be it. So you should you should be allowed to have that. Mm, mm. Um, a lot of that was stemmed from the fact that there were some uh, some teething issues in regards to let's say driver safety. So in Newcastle, it was talked about that cabin temperatures are very hot. Now it was very very warm in Newcastle, yep. uh, and so the teams on the fly were sort of creating some workarounds to to do that. Now. They've always complained about heat in in V8 supercar land. All right, so I mean, and back in the early days of the early Adelaide 500s, there were drivers that were actually collapsing because yep. of the supposed heat, yep. heat exhaustion, heat exhaustion on their feet. Yep, exactly right. So it's not like we're immune from any of this sort of stuff. So I can't imagine how much more hotter a car could possibly get, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, but clearly, it's an, it's an issue. And then we had engine fires that. Uh, well, two fires that happened to Mustangs in particular at the Melbourne Grand Prix. Now, mm-hmm. I find it fascinating how they got through two standing starts, mm-hmm. multiple qualifying sessions, right, and two full-length race distances of about 85, 90 laps or whatever it was in Newcastle. Not a problem like it. Mm-hmm. And then you go to Melbourne and all of a sudden there's two major issues that affect the Ford Mustang. So to put it into context and explain it correctly, Brad Jones released a video a couple of weeks ago detailing what the causes are. And, uh, and this is what he had to say. Hi there. I thought I'd attempt today to explain to you my theory on what's going on with the fires. So this could be right or wrong. I'm not an engineer, a fireman, a chemist or a mechanic. I'm just an old race car driver and looking around, this is what I think. So the first part of the puzzle is the engine. So we usually run induction and all the standoff gets sprayed into the air cleaner. But with a standard manifold um, and and pretty much a standard piston ring combination and block, a lot of, we're getting blow by, so some of the fuel is blowing by the rings and getting into the oil. So the mechanics hit at BJR have noticed that the oil, when we drain it, smells like a road car. So clearly some of the fuel is, is, is getting by the rings and getting mixed up with the oil. 
So once the engine's rotating, then the oil gets pumped into this catch can, so it doesn't have a sump on it like a standard car. It has a dry sump, so this is where the oil's retained. So the oil comes in here. Um, when all the parts are moving in the engine, we get some air in the oil as well, and, and th what this does is it separates the air out. Once it's done that, it blows the air out of here into the catch can. There's a hose around the back there you can't see. So then what happens is it goes into the catch can, all the fume in the air sprays around and then gets, gets shot out of the top. Now, normally this has a little filter on top of it, which sits here. So what, what one of the, the general consensus is that all this is going on with the engine, the engine's breathing pretty heavily. We're getting oil all across here and on this skirt, you can see a, there's still a little bit of bit of residue down in the bar work here. And then when the car is on the rev limiter and we're waiting to start for 10 seconds, all the exhausts are red hot. And we see that when we're warming the cars up, they get, get very hot. Got a, got a lot of fumes floating around in here and it's getting to the point and it's igniting. And once it's done that, it starts on, on this inner guard and it burns the inner guard and the fire starts. So what supercars did on Saturday night to, to try and manage the risk was we did a rolling start so they weren't sitting on the limiter. We got rid of these and we ran a, a pipe off the top of our catch can down into the atmosphere so it's down underneath the car. We, you, I don't know if you can see here, but this is where the TPS sensor goes. So we disconnected that so there was no electrical current running across here. So all these things were done to try and mitigate the, the, the chance of having a fire until we could go away from the race meeting and have a look at all these things and try and work out what was going on. So normally uh, out, of the top of the, um, out of the top of the rocker cover, you can see there's a little cap there. It also breathes out through that and, and breeze into the catch can. On the Ford, it's got a proportioning valve in it which, which limits the vacuum in the engine and which ever so slightly affects the horsepower. So it didn't have that valve at Newcastle, or the Mustangs didn't, most of them. So that was another thing, they took that, that valve out. Now, this is what a catch can looks like when it's, when it's out of the car. So you can see at the bottom it has a drain and you can see it's really a two piece item. This is, this is where the um, oil tank breathes into the catch can, and then you can see the fumes would come out the top here. If you look, that's a new filter, and you have a look at that one that's off the car after two race meetings, it's a lot darker, so it's breathing pretty heavily. So supercars will look at this and the teams will look at it, and hopefully we'll come up with an option for sure. We'll, we'll I'd say, be ducting the breather away right now. It's down near the exhaust. It probably needs to go to the back of the car. There's a lot of work to be done, but you know we're gonna have some of the best minds in motorsport looking at it and hopefully we'll come up with the right result. Fingers crossed, because uh, it's very, very expensive and a lot of hard work for teams to pretty much rebuild a car in a very short space of time. And considering the deadlines that these teams had to meet uh, in order to make the grid for Newcastle, to get two cars nearly burned to the ground uh, for something of that nature, they they need to get it right. So absolutely. fingers crossed. Yeah, that was some pretty big fires. Yeah, absolutely. So thankfully, all drivers walked away uh, unscathed. Let's find out what grinds your gears. Now it's time for Grind My Gears with Jamie and Lee. And hey, Mr. Harrison, before we end our show, tell me, what grinds your gears? Righto, so... You've been to my house. You know the street that I live on. Yes. I've got, you know, there's some people, our next door neighbours, the, the kids live with them. Um, they have friends come over. They've got the boyfriends, you know, girlfriends, whatever, for the kids. Mm -hmm. So when I come home from work, any day of the week, especially late at night, though, this is what, when it really grinds my gears. And the whole street is taken up with parking on the side of the road. And I've got to park like two or three houses down the road from my own house because of all the cars in the street. It grinds my gears. So I'm like, oh, this is my call now with all the the things we've secured gather around for the next three years. But I, this has not got to be next on Mally's hit list. That He needs to pass a law in South Australia that the verge immediately outside of one's residence is reserved for 
the owner of the car of said residence in case there's two cars that need to be on that residence so that I can park out the front of my own house. Here, here. I like it. Grinds my gears. I can can completely understand. And I'm actually quite surprised because where the AGL building is raised to work years ago, there's a whole series of back streets behind that building where you're not allowed to park there unless you actually have a residency permit. Yeah. On your window. Yeah. And I did park there once and did get fined for it. (laughs) So, I'm surprised considering you guys don't live that far away from the location, why that street doesn't actually have it. Because there's not really a a business or workplace around there that has mass mass people coming to it for parking. So, I guess there's no need to have residential permits. And then even if it was a residential permit place, it doesn't mean that the people next door couldn't park out the front of my house. Um I think it just should be that's that's my spot. I, I, that's yeah, my spot. I know. I'm like like Sheldon out of Big Bang Theory. You're in in you're in my spot. That's my spot. <laughs> you're in my spot, Penny. I was going to say, uh, well, you know what? I, I think um, Shay Thyer Intuit, um, notorious Sky News uh, special guest, mm-hmm. uh, relative celebrity of LinkedIn, and uh, and also a, a plethora of accounting podcasts and shows should start to flex some of those muscles that she works and flexes out at yoga on every morning mm. at God knows o'clock in the morning. I feel like she should have our back here. I reckon she should. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's I think for to get her in. Yep, yep. I reckon if you're going to have that sort of level of media presence, then <laughs> that you need to start to have your own dedicated couple, two car park spots, that's yeah, all. Exactly, exactly. If, yep. if you've got to park three houses down because you're the 17th car at such a premise, then that's that's too bad, too sad. Yeah. Don't make me park down there when I'm the only car that yeah. needs to go in my premise. And all you want to do is sit in your hammock in the backyard and chill out exactly. for an hour after. I just want, I just want to get inside, have a scotch, and uh, then go to bed. A scotch even? Yeah. Wow. you got to have a scotch when you're in your hammock. Uh, true. I, well, actually, I can't drink spirits anymore, so... <laughs> very relaxing. Have one for me. I'll have seven. <laughs> make <it> eight. <laughs> <laughs> you know what actually really grinds my gears, speaking of parking? So you've been to my house. You know how you mm-hmm. go on the back street and you've got that dip of that road that then veers to the right and it heads up. Mm-hmm. So we're going on to Amber Road off Low North East. When cars park right on the apex <laughs> as you're going down the hill mm-hmm. and you've got to actually brake because it's a blind corner, mm-hmm. you go over the crest and down and then you've got to brake like the monsters to utilise every little ounce of ABS that you've got to make sure that you don't hit the car that's parked on the apex, on the apex yeah. and the car that's around that's meant to be rounding at the same corner as you that grinds my gears yeah no, that is that is rubbish yes yep yeah cuz one of these days it may not be me but one of these days someone's going to go over that crest flick that corner around and there's going to be a nice accident and in there. destroy houses and all sorts of stuff exactly so Gears ground, man. Done. Done. No gears left. There are no gears left. <laughs> synchro. It's just like your car outside. There's no synchros. No synchros. Uh, we are done. Yep. No yeah. jokes tonight. Thank frick for that. Keep it. Rate it. I did just. Just. Yep. Just. But we'll be back uh, in a couple of weeks' time with, uh, with Tim from Techno, maybe Dr. Dez. Um, can you imagine having a title like Dr. Dez and the Brown and the Techno Cowboys? But that might sound a bit... <laughs> Bit yeah, bit full on. <laughs> like you know, Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. Elton John. But anyway, we hope you enjoyed the show, and uh, it's good to be back, mate. Have a safe trip and a safe drive. Please come back in one piece. I'll do my best. Um, and have fun, enjoy it, and tell Cody if he doesn't bring his A game qualifying, I'm taking the damn seat. Yeah, now we're done. Yeah, <laughs> what done for me driving the seat? <laughs> no, he's done. <laughs> he's done. <laughs> yeah. But uh, now all the best, mate. Have fun, and uh, definitely come back with some stories from AKC. Thank you. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. 
The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.